Well, from the real big, you want to go back to start. So what's what's a drumlin? Okay, let's start there. Um, what's a drumlin? Well, the, the most simple way of describing it is to say a drumlin is a hill. It's an elongate hill that has a particular sort of morphology. So these are examples of drumlins. These are from the Kuwaitan area of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. So they're basically in a very long, broad uh, swath of land, east, sorry, west of Hudson's Bay and east of Great Slave Lake. Okay, if you look at Google Earth, you can see that there is thousands of these hills. And the drumlin itself is this, this elongate hill. Okay. Now, if you look through all the literature that you might find, in, and even in, in textbooks, they'll tell you that a drumlin is uh, like an inverted egg or an inverted half egg, uh, or it's like the back of a spoon and that kind of descriptive words to explain them. But fundamentally, it's a hill. It's elongate, meaning that it's not, you know, it's got a long axis and it's got a much shorter uh, transverse sort of access to it. You can see that there's a ridge that defines the drumlin. And then many drumlins, not all of them, are not fully symmetrical. So sometimes you get perfect symmetry in the hill. Other times there's a, one side of the drumlin that's steeper than the other. More often than not, and certainly if you read books, they'll tell you that the, the side that is what we call the stoss side uh, tends to be steeper. And then it tapers down a gentler slope on the backside. But in reality, when some recently some people have done some work using digital terrain models, and really uh, you get everything. You get fully symmetrical ones. You get some that are asymmetric that sort of have a steep side on one end, and other times the steep side is on the other end. So we don't have to get hung up exactly on the morphology. But the idea is that it's this elongate hill. The other way that I think you have to think about drumlins is that they occur in groups. So it kind of sounds funny when you say, well, look, what's a drumlin? And you describe it as an elongate hill. But part of the, the way that you recognize drumlins is that it tends to happen in big groups. Okay, so it's related to other forms that are similar. There's these big clusters of drumlins, hundreds to thousands, if not tens of thousands of them that you find together. So part of your ability to recognize a drumlin is probably also related to the fact that it's next to very similar hills of similar shape and similar orientation. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So... Could you uh, once you sort of go, yeah, that that the stoss side is generally going to be the up, if whether it's glacier flow or water flow or a combination that has ultimately sculpted the drumlins, the uh, the tapered end is usually going to be uh, down downstream. Right? Yeah, exactly. Stoss so, sail, which is the upstream side. Right, and so what you're getting into is kind of what what do we use drumlins for right i mean what do they tell us and what we use them for if you think of it from the standpoint of producing maps and trying to understand former ice sheets is that people will use drumlins as indicators of flow okay and i'll keep it at flow not necessarily you know in the, in the minds of many it's ice flow and in some cases as we'll discuss later it could be representing water flow underneath the glacier but the idea is that the elongation is sort of pointing in the direction of flow okay and in the case where you have drumlins that aren't perfectly symmetrical, the stoss, we call the stoss side or the, the side of the drumlin that you could call the upflow side, the one pointing into the flow, whatever the flow is, the, what does, that's, what, that's the, the stoss side and that's the one that's going to be steeper. Okay, so the asymmetry puts the steep side facing into the, into the flow. Now, if you map enough drumlins, and I'll show you some other examples in a second, um, you realize that they have enormous variability in their morphology. So here's another example. This is from a terrain model, a DM. You get the idea of elongation, right? You can see sort of, the, it kind of looks like streaks on the landscape. But each one of these ridges here represents one of these drumlins. And uh, you realize quickly that they're, they're grouped, right? I mean, you can't just look at this landscape and miss the fact that they're actually just completely grouped and that there's, there's these very close relationships between the forms. Sure, they, they vary in shape and they vary in length and everything, but fundamentally, there's just a cluster of these forms together. More examples. Um, this is from, the, from Wisconsin, Green Bay Lobe, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's really just to show you, so the color image is just a portion of this gray one. You can see on this gray map, this is the moraine that marks the margin of the lobe. So you get a picture that basically ice was flowing from the top of the picture to the bottom. The white line here, the Johnstown Moraine marks the furthest extent of that lobe of ice. And what you're seeing uh, to the top of this picture, so basically underneath the, the lobe and 
upflow of the lobe is the bed of the ice sheet, the former bed of the ice sheet, which is the modern landscape today. But uh, I've noted all these little elongate hills, which are all the drumlins. So there's a 20 kilometer scale bar. We're probably looking at, uh, you know, like 40 miles across the entire picture. And just looking at the number, you realize there's dozens, if not hundreds of these drumlins that cover the entirety or almost the entirety of this, this lobe, the footprint of the, the, the lobe. And if you zoom into a portion of that, the drumlins look like these. And so within even just that little area, there's lots of variability in terms of the shapes. There's some really long and skinny ones, and there are some shorter, stubbier ones, but they all have this elongation. Okay, so if we're going to define a drumlin, elongated hill, but really occurring in a cluster of others of similar hills. So looking at that map in the top left, you got the little inset showing yeah. the Laurentide ice sheet exactly. and then the block that's that's expanded. Uh, so it's far southeastern Wisconsin. So basically, those are just north of Chicago. Yep. Exactly. I'm guessing, of I'm guessing not, most people in Chicago have no idea that the landscape looks like that just outside <laughs> the city or the story behind it. But, but yeah, I'm glad we had a little scale on that one, the 20 kilometers, because the previous one, I was wondering what how, how long some of those forms were. Yeah, the thing is, is that given the, the, the canopy of trees and vegetation, they're not readily apparent from the ground. That's right. Or, or there's in some cases they would be, but you know, out in an open plowed field or something. But I mean, like everything in geology, the scale is important, right? So if you look at just this image, you can see that individual drumlins are often, you know, two, three, maybe even four kilometers long. So, it, you know, it would take you a while to walk the length of one single right. drumlin. <laughs> right. And if you climb on them, again, the height of the drumlins varies depending where, where you find them. It's, it's a variable quantity there. So they can be a few meters in height, sometimes tens of meters. And in the biggest cases, they could be close to 100 meters or more in height. So there's quite a bit of variability in terms of the morphology. But the, you recognize them in part because of this uh, elongation and some of the patterns in the groupings. And of course, you know, to make it a drumlin, it has to be something glacial. So it has to be within the footprint of a former ice sheet or glacier. So no drumlins in Texas. Or, you know. That's a point Randall made last week that, it, you know, you never find them outside where there was an ice sheet. It's, they were always under the glacier. That's right. Yeah. Now, I noticed there on the, was you know, on the, on the, the broader view, how they seem to essentially be splayed outwards. Yeah, on this lobe they are, exactly. So you can see if you look at the patterns, and I'll show you a map of, of what we'd call flow lines. So if you sort of group and you map enough drumlins, you start seeing regional patterns in mm -hmm. the direction that they're, they're following and or their, their orientation. And so you start seeing exactly that, some splaying here. So for example, if I use my cursor, these sort of kind of curve and go in this direction mm -hmm. while these curve and go in the opposite direction. So they kind of have this display pattern. So we were just saying before that, you know, what, so what, you know, <laughs> so what do you use drumlins for? What are they, why are they so interesting and mysterious? Part of the reason is because we use them to map and we try to, they're really integral to the reconstruction of an ice sheet and understanding how big it was and the direction of flow. And if you're going to map ice sheets and glaciers, you know, you kind of use moraines as best you can to sort of mark the furthest extent of the ice sheet. But that kind of puts a line on the map in terms of the ice probably, you know, didn't go further than this line at this point. But if you cover a continent or the better part of North America or in Canada and the northern U.S. in ice, um, that ice was following different directions. It was moving in different directions. It's not a uniform flow path across uh, the entire landscape. So the drumlins become landforms that are potentially useful in trying to understand the path of the, the flow, essentially. And so if you start mapping enough drumlins, you can start seeing what we would call flow lines and flow tracks. And so this is a map that was actually made by uh, John Shaw a few years ago. And the thing to notice here is that the blue lines are generalized flow lines. And so it means that, you know, you imagine that you, you map enough drumlins and you'd see a regional pattern and continuity between the drumlins and you can sort of start tracing pathways. And Groupings of these flow lines will define the broad yellow zone, which are the zones that are what in this case were called flow tracks. So just call them, you know, groups of flow lines. But what you see is that the patterns of drumlins records, you know, very variable directions of flow 
You've got some in the north that are heading uh, in the north part of Canada, to west of Hudson's Bay, that are heading almost due north to the Arctic. Others are heading due west. Some are going to the south towards the Dakotas and uh, eastern Montana. We were looking at uh, that previous image where we're down in the Midwest and the Great Lakes area. There's flow lines that go to the towards the margin there. What you're seeing over Quebec and Labrador are its own little system of flow lines. And so it's reflecting the fact that the Laurentide Ice Sheet grew and developed and built up essentially uh, a number of spreading centers. The ice was emanating from multiple locations and it had what we call ice divides. So there's a point where you know, ice is moving in one direction and past that point it's moving in the other direction, much like you have a divide in the watershed where rain on the landscape flows into one basin versus another. Uh, you can think of it that way a bit with ice. And so these flow lines help us sort of picture the, uh, the, the patterns of ice flow and potentially, as we'll discuss, meltwater flow that might be, be present. So the drumlins are really, really central to making sense of uh, glacial pattern and dispersal patterns. Now, one of the interesting and at the same time perplexing things about drumlins is that every ice sheet, active or uh, paleo ice sheet, former ice sheet, those that disappeared after the last ice age, has drumlins on its bed. Some glaciers seem to have, some smaller glaciers also seem to have landforms that resemble drumlins. People have been identifying drumlins and thinking about their genesis, how they formed for centuries, and were uh, not really at a point of consensus on how they form. Okay, so this is something that people have been mulling over, trying to understand, and come up with multiple, you know, with some explanation as to how they form. And we haven't arrived at sort of a, an, an explanation that sort of satisfies all the observations that we tend to see and um, that can be unequivocally stated as being, this is how drumlins form. <laughs> okay, we're not there. Despite, you know, centuries of people looking at these, these forms and trying to understand what they are and how they, they're created. So uh, they're, enigm they're enigmatic that way, right? There's a lot of questions that uh, trying to understand drumlins triggers in terms of how we think ice sheets work and how the bed of an ice sheet operates and what's the role of water versus you know large amounts of water or small amounts of water or no water at all and while you've yeah, got go that ahead, map right. up there jerome well i just wanted you to point out the the great slave lake and then where that that field that is from was? that first picture you showed and you know that's probably hundreds of square miles or, or more probably out there isn't it yeah so that first photo was taken out of a helicopter and it's in this area here. It's within this big flow track right there. Okay. Right. It's one drumlin amongst many thousands that makes up these probably eight or 10 flow lines as part of this flow track. Okay. That's Got sort it. of, um, that's sort of the, no, sorry, I'm on the wrong lake here. Sorry. Great slave right here in this area, just below it. Okay. One the of other, many flow the other one's Bear Lake. Yeah, Bear sorry. Lake. Great Bear. Yeah, my bad. Right. Yep. Yeah. This is the east arm of Great Slave Lake right here, and that's the flow track is right in here. This is where the cursor is. All right. So uh, let's get right into it because I know that Randall was interested in the, this discussion about this idea. So in the, in the process of trying to understand drumlins, in the early 80s, John Shaw uh, and some of his colleagues proposes or they propose a model uh, that involves essentially very, very large floods of water under the ice to create drumlins, okay? It's happening at a time uh, when other ideas already exist in terms of explaining how drumlins are, might be created. It involves mostly at the time um, the idea that the bed of glaciers deformed. So if you're, you may have talked about materials, glacial materials like till and things like that in your in your show before, but the sediment that's produced by the abrasion and the breakdown of rocks on the bed of glaciers produces this really, really poorly sorted mixture. So it's got every grain size, it's got clays, silt, sand, gravel, big boulders. And this is what's basically a, a layer of sediment that's on the bed of glaciers. And it's produced both by um, abrasion and the breakdown of rocks, but also there's a bit of transport of the material underneath the glacier. And the transport is often facilitated by the fact that you can deform that sediment when it gets saturated with water. So it's not dry sand, gravel, and clay. It's actually often quite wet. And uh, it can be fully saturated in water. 
And that layer of sediment deforms. It accommodates some of the movement of the glacier. So the glacier is not just sliding on bedrock or sliding on some of that, that material. It can actually also move because the sediment itself is moving. And at the time, in the 70s and 80s and even before, um, people had a, clearly an inkling that the till was an important component to understanding the formation of drumlins because many drumlins are composed of till. But some drumlins are also composed of other materials that's not till, which kind of becomes problematic because you think, well, if you think that the drumlin is forming because till is deforming and it kind of builds up a, a hill of till, then how do we explain those that aren't made of till? Or how do we explain those that are just made of rock? Because sometimes you see the drumlins are made of rock only. So there is, again, I said, you know, it's been centuries since people have been looking at drumlins and uh, there's no real consensus on their origins. So this was one of those cases where there were some open questions. There were some issues in terms of being able to have an, a hypothesis that explains the range of observations. And so an alternative hypothesis proposed by Shaw at the time is that uh, drumlins actually are formed by water flowing underneath uh, large ice sheets. And when I'm saying that, it means you know vast quantities of water. We'll get there in a second, but vast quantities of water, enormous amounts, basically mega flood scale amounts of water that are moving underneath the glacier. Okay, so I wanted to put that up front just to give you a visual of what's, uh, what this idea entails, but then I'll sort of walk you through the steps of how we get there to understand what the evidence is to, that's been used to, to support this model. But if we explain this diagram real quick, picture that you have a bedrock on the bed of a glacier, you've got some amount of sediment, and you've got a series of landforms that are produced and they include drumlins, as we've been talking about. There's some till here, we call this lodgement till. That's one of the types of till. Um, we've got drumlins, we've got other forms that we call rogans, rogan moraines, same idea, same, same landform, slightly different terminology. And the idea here is that what we've done is just lift up the lid of ice. So this is the ice sheet, just a cutaway of the ice sheet. And we're sort of hinging it up so we can expose the bed. And then there's this sheet of water that flows across the landscape. And it's that sheet of water that does essentially the bulk of the work in terms of creating the landforms that are then found on the bed of the glacier. So in this model, it's not the direct interaction of the substrate and the ice that produces the landforms. It's actually the passage of this sheet of water underneath the glacier that can either erode or, as we'll see in a second, um, create spaces for deposition of sediment that will then become drumlins. So, you know, one of the issues with drumlins uh, and why it's taken centuries to figure out, and maybe you could argue we haven't quite gotten there yet, uh, how they form, is that, you know, it's really tough to study ice sheets because if you study ice sheets after they're gone, obviously you don't really know what they're doing at the time of drumlin formation. You're always sort of working backwards from the evidence that you see in the field. So you got to work from the basically the sedimentary and landform record, and you have to sort of work backwards to try to understand the process out of what you can understand from the deposits. Or you could go to a modern ice sheet, because we said that, you know, it seems like every major ice sheet seems to be forming f landforms like drumlins, but obviously it's under an ice sheet, right? <laughs> and accessing the bed of an ice sheet is pretty complicated. So, really? so you, you, you know, that, that's a real hurdle to making you know progress that way because it's uh it's very very tricky in terms of getting data whether you're looking at the former drumlins and the former the former bed of an ice sheet or if you're looking at an active ice sheet say in antarctica so you have to use other methods other tools like geophysical tools that give you some it's kind of a type of remote sensing to try to understand something about the bed of the glacier and that's active and how it might be moving sediment and how it might be shaping its bed into particular landforms uh, you can look at areas that have been recently deglaciated, but obviously, again, you're not really observing it directly. So you're kind of always playing catch up in terms of the process. You're not observing it as you are, as it's forming in the moment. It's not like if you're studying a river where you can actually stick instruments very easily into a river and measure the speed of the flow and the movement of sediment, right? So there's, yeah. a, there's a hurdle there that is just, you can't really get around the fact that those areas are environments that are very hard to access. It's the measurement problem of drumlin mechanics. <laughs> yeah, That's right. exactly. So you have to proceed in a lot of cases by analogy. Exactly. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Analogy is key. And in fact, analogy was 
not exclusively, but in large part, the basis for this picture, this model that I'm going to try to explain to you, which is what John Chaw proposed. So let's start small scale and we'll go up, but you'll see why, because the analogy connection is pretty uh, poignant with these, these next few slides. So in glaci glaciated landscapes, there are many outcrops in glaciated landscape, landscapes that have really beautiful, spectacular marks of erosion. In other words, the bedrock has been eroded into very um, intricate shapes and forms. This is one example of an outcrop of marble near just north of Ottawa. And I'll just uh, point out there that this is an elongate outcrop, but on that surface, you'll see all kinds of elongate sort of high standing parts surrounded by depressions. There's a depression wrapping around the front and extends to the sides. We call these rat tails, just as a term that, you know, we, we give names to things and various scientific disciplines. So this is commonly called a rat tail, but really what you should see there is a residual, right? There's rock that's been removed and the rock has been preferentially removed around the sides and around the front of it, which gives be, leaves behind a residual and leaves behind some amount of rock that's shaped as a function of what's been removed around the flanks and the front of it. And there's a big one there. There's a couple of small ones over here. There's a series of other small ones there. And if you get in a bit closer, you'll see that they they occur at multiple scales. So there's a small one here. There's another one here that you can see the the well, the furrow on the on the edge of it, and it wraps around the front. So on this picture, as on the one that comes after, the flow is from right of the picture to the left. It's the same idea here. The flow is from the right of the picture to the left. What you might notice on here is that the surface is full of kind of scratches. And these are what we call striations or striae. And they're pretty uh, diagnostic. In fact, not too many people argue about striations. Uh, that's probably the best piece of evidence you have for abrasion by a glacier. In other words, if you think of a, a glacier, the base of a glacier that's charged with uh, all kinds of pieces of rock and other sediment as a great big piece of sandpaper that's sliding over a bedrock surface, it's going to abrade it. It scratches it and it breaks down the rock. And at the same time as it does it, it smooths it and polishes it a bit. But fundamentally, it scratches and it breaks it down sort of grain by grain as the, the, the rocks interact with uh, the surface. And so you produce these striations and they're very diagnostic of glaciation because they occur all over glaciated bedrock surfaces. So these particular forms have striations, which we might be taking on as examples of or evidence of abrasion, but they also have these really intricate uh, sort of kind of sculpted components to them. You know, these little furrows and the wraparound parts that leave behind the residuals. If you look at other examples of them, you can see them on other bedrock surfaces. All these are from examples of, of glaciated areas, but you can see it really well. In this case, the flow is from the bottom to the top on this picture. And there's a very hard uh, little piece of chert, which is a silica-rich sedimentary rock that's quite hard. So it resists erosion and abrasion a bit better than other surrounding rocks. And it's an inclusion there, a little nodule. And what you've done is you've removed, you've stripped away material around the nodule to pr produce this really nicely curved or horseshoe-shaped little trough or a little moat, this what's called here a crescentic scour. And then it extends laterally continuously to the furrow, which leaves behind the residual. And you no. have it there, you have it here, same idea, flow from bottom to top. Here the flow is from right to left. But this is a pattern that we see frequently on bedrock surfaces that have, uh, that have been under a glacier. Can I quick? Please. On B, uh, yeah. we are looking at a form that was, was that produced, that's plaster, right? With a chert nodule, is, is that correct? Is that no, correct? that one is actually bedrock. No, that's actually bedrock. Yeah. What okay. you're thinking about is this. That's what I was thinking of. Okay. Yeah. So in the attempts to ex ex explain how these forms are produced, whatever size they are, you know, you get you got some here on the bottom on D that are really small, a few centimeters. In other cases, you know, the previous photo, you can see that they can be very, you know, many meters in length. Irrespective of the actual size of it, you try to explain these and you kind of, you face a bit of a conundrum because there's components of those forms that are probably best explained by erosion by water. The fact that you have this crescentic scour here mm -hmm. is uh, pretty diagnostic, I think, and I'll show you some of the other evidence for it in a second, but pretty diagnostic of 
what you have when a turbulent fluid encounters an obstacle and has to flow or split around that obstacle, it's called flow separation, you get uh, initiation of a vortex, a turbulent structure that splits around and um, essentially is capable of excavating and eroding around that splits around the nodule or any obstacle, is capable of excavating the material preferentially there as well as along the flanks. I would argue, and I think some people would disagree, but I would argue that that sort of feature is not something you produce easily when it's only ice moving over a surface. Ice is far too viscous to be turbulent at that scale, and in, it's therefore not able to preferentially remove material at the front of this obstacle and along the flanks. Okay, so if you have a glacier moving and encountering an obstacle on its bed, like a big bump, it's going to have to flow around it. There's no question about that. But um, it will not preferentially excavate around the, the front of this obstacle, in large part because this form that leaves behind really, really sharp ridges or sharp rims around the, the, the part that's excavated, that is not something you expect out of glacial abrasion. Abrasion tends to plane things off, right? Mm -hmm. It makes things smoother. It doesn't preferentially strip away material in one location versus another. Okay, that's a, one of the biggest, I think, uh, pieces of evidence that supports the idea that some of the glacial forms we see on the landscape have had the uh, influence or have been formed either entirely or in large part by, by water, turbulent water. Now, how do we arrive at this conclusion or can, how can I make this statement? Well, you can run experiments, and that's one of the ways you try to figure out how enigmatic landforms like Drummond's might actually be created because you can't really get on the bed of the, the active ice sheet. And if you're dealing with a landscape, well, you obviously don't see what's going on. So you run some experiments. You know, there's a whole side of experimentation that's really useful. So Randall was asking about plaster of Paris. So this is an example of this. This is uh, the white parts that you see there are plaster, fine grain uh, plaster of Paris. And inside the plaster of Paris are some obstacle, little chunks of, um, little cubes, I think they're cubes of pyrite or something like that, or something more resistant. And then they're put in a flume where you run water over them, and the obstacles trigger the formation of vortices, and those vortices then, this turbulent structure, that's the, the, this vortex, is able to selectively, if you want, erode and remove material in specific locations. And so specifically where you see it being removed is right around the obstacles themselves. We start seeing similar forms. This is the idea of the analogy, right? We start seeing, a, you know, this form looks very much like the form we see on that outcrop north of Ottawa or other outcrops elsewhere. But here we've got a pretty good idea of what's going on. We have a pretty good control on the conditions where it forms, the, the fluid that's moving over it. And so this is probably one of the better examples, but here's a little residual ridge that you have here, and then you can clearly see the moat around it that stretches laterally. So this ridge exists only, and we see it only because we've been able to strip away selectively the plaster of Paris around this area, right? So that's a low or negative part or negative form, and this is a residual high point. Does that make sense? Is the visual kind of clear mm -hmm. that way? So oh, yes. if we go it's, back it's, this way, we see, hey, look, there's an obstacle, mm -hmm. there's a residual high, and there's a moat, so mm -hmm. a negative form, stretching, wrapping around the front, stretching along the flanks, this furrow and scour combo that are leaves behind this residual. Well, and there's the same thing here. There's a, this, a tiny one and more moats and, and furrows. Yeah, Brad. Well, I was just going to point out, if, if people haven't picked up on it, you've got some items uh, there for scale. You've got a coin in the lower left on C, and then there's the, the camera lens cover on B there. So just so people see that, you know, we're in a much smaller scale uh, but it's pretty much identical forms uh, that we're seeing on a wide range of, you know, scales. So uh, that's one of my roles, scale man, point, point out scale differences. <laughs> yeah, it's, a good po it's a good point, but in a way, the scale doesn't matter. Right. This is yes. one of the incredible things about all of this is that we're going to, I'll show you some pictures in a second of drumlins that are kilometers long, but the form is identical. Exactly. So if you don't know the scale, you might not be able to tell whether it's, you know, 15 centimeters long or 1.5 kilometers long. But the, the form is so uh, diagnostic and you recognize so many of the, the most critical components of the form that the process that form that might be responsible for creating that 
becomes essentially obvious or becomes self-evident just because of the such a strong uh, similarity of form and the analogy between the two. What what makes analogy, I think, such a powerful tool is the scale invariant nature of this phenomena. And I think you cited in the recent paper, seven orders of magnitude yeah. spanned. That's pretty amazing, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite incredible. All right, so let's be, we're talking scale. Let's bump up scale. Yeah, so, let's, let's do. So we've got these plaster of Paris little obstacles. Um, in this case, it's a few centimeters across the entire picture. But now we're moving into something that's, I think, something along the lines of 400 meters across the entire picture. Okay, so bottom left to top right. We've now jumped up a few orders. This is in uh, the French River area of Ontario. It's a bedrock escarpment. And so it's like a step made of rock, but that step had, was facing into the flow of both ice and, in this case, in water. And it's been sculpted. It's been eroded selectively. And we start recognizing exactly the same forms that we were just seeing very small before and somewhere in between the two scales for the outcrop north of Ottawa. But let me point, to you, point out to you the important parts that you need to be able to recognize to see the forms. If you think of the moat and the lateral furrows, often those little moats, because they're negatives or depressions, they fill up with water. So every one of these little black spots mm -hmm. or dark spot is a bit of a puddle of water. And it's there because it occupies one of these crescentic troughs that extends laterally. So you can see there's a good example here. There's a crescentic one that la moves laterally to this one. Uh, there's a portion of one here. There's another one here and the, the furrows extend laterally. There's more over here. So you see, for example, that the erosion is obviously most prominent around the, the nose of the form on the front of it. And it tapers a bit down slow. So as you proceed, so the flow would have been from bottom right to top left here. So as you proceed along the flanks of it, you know, the, the furrows peter out, they sort of disappear a bit. Uh, so the, the, the lakes are preferentially formed at the nose of the form because that's where you have the deepest scour and depression. Mm -hmm. Then I think you use the term shoulders. Yeah, exactly. So you have the, yeah, you have the, the neck, you have the nose, and you have the shoulders. Okay, we can, we can go that way if you want. <laughs> I just, I like that. Okay, I go, or we can go front, or we can go stoss, and we can go on the flanks, whatever works. It all so, works for me. A couple other examples, because I, I actually just think those forms are beautiful, regardless of how they form. They're just striking. Oh, yeah. Like the sculpting is, is really something that's uh, incredible. And so this is from a place called Kelly's Island in uh, Lake Erie in, in Ohio. There is a uh, very prominent, it's, a, it's an actual state park, I think, where you can go and visit. But there's a prominent uh, channel, basically, cut in limestone. And the inside of this channel is entirely sculpted with these forms. So it'll give you an appreciation for the range of forms and how they might organize themselves together. There are some examples there. We're, I was talking earlier about kind of this conundrum between what abrasion by ice does and what water erosion does. And this is a good illustration of that. You can see here, so what we're looking at here are these very in intricate sort of curved uh, erosional depressions that are in the bedrock and the limestone, but within those depressions, all these little remnant, very delicate little rims and ridges inside. These are not features that we necessarily expect to be preserved as ice uh, potentially abrades this. It tends, what it would tend to do is actually attack and wear down these mm -hmm. rims preferentially. They're sticking out the most and they would undergo the most amount of abrasion early on and they would tend to wear away so that we wouldn't preserve them. So the fact that they're preserved there um, is potentially a very good uh, piece of evidence to argue that it's not, in fact, ice that abrades these forms into that shape, but it's really water that produces the key part of the erosion that's, that uh, leaves these residuals. So it's definitely not uh, a product of the rock itself then? Like that, that some of those areas are just much tougher? Is so, that part of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in some cases, there is something going on with the rock itself. So I'll go back a few slides, uh, like this one here. That outcrop near Ottawa has inclusions of rocks that are much harder. And we do see okay. that preferentially, those seem to be the points where the vortex starts to occur, right? That's right. where it, initi it initiates. 
Yep. So having an inclusion or something harder, an obstacle, something that essentially uh, creates a, a perturbation in the flow might be the point where you start the process, right? Okay. But then yeah. the rock around it, in this case, it's marble, is softer than this inclusion. And so we, we excavate uh, more just because the rock is softer. And so we preserve this, this inclusion. So the inclusion is both an initiate, uh, initiation point, but it also it survives longer in that sense, right? Right. But you can absolutely start those forms without having an inclusion necessarily. It's okay. not a give, it's not a, an absolute requirement, but it certainly helps the process if you do. Okay, so let's get to the pictures of um, this is inside this channel uh, at Kelly's Island, and there is a an interesting paper written about these forms that maps those crescentic scours and the extent of the furrows. And so you really get the idea of how many of these forms are superimposed within this conduit. So there's a lot of very delicate forms that are preserved and that are um, present within this conduit. So it's a channel that the interpretation certainly is that it was conveying lots of water that was flowing turbulently. And within that turbulent flow were these coherent uh, turbulent structures that were preferentially excavating these troughs and leaving behind these residuals inside. So it's essentially it's uh, erosion by a turbulent fluid. And you were asking about the rock itself, but really you have to picture that it's not just pure clean water. More, more than likely it's water that's carrying lots of fine sediment in it. And that sediment is also able to do some work in terms of you know excavating and eroding and abrading because it's kind of like a wet sanding effect. But in the uh, but mostly driven by the, the turbulence in the water. There's some details of those mm. surfaces inside the conduit. So you start recognizing, you know, there's some lots of similarities between these Ohio forms and those that I showed you from French River in Ontario. The scale's mm -hmm. a bit different. These are a little bit smaller. But again, if you don't get hung up on the fact that they have to be the same size, which they don't, you start seeing the same shape or the same form irrespective of scale. Yeah, that's and, amazing. And as that's you see, true. yeah, I mean, they're beautiful, right? They're just, yeah. It's, that's what uh, I was going to say. It's quite beautiful, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the sculpting is just, I don't know. I don't, yeah, it's, 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 it's one of the things, you know, you're asking how do I get into this field? Because I went to that outcrop near Ottawa as an undergrad and I saw those forms. And I thought, wow, that's just interesting, period, because it's yeah. beautiful. It, <laughs> well, it's beautiful. It's it beautiful is, you know? And yet the fact that it's diagnostic and you can look at this thing, and it's indication of paleo current direction. Yeah. To me, is it's it's just like it's telling you this story. And you yeah. go clearly, there was a there was a phenomena that happened here. Whatever the exact nature of this sculpting was, it was something and it was a very interesting process. Yeah. So I mean, since we're on the topic of sculpting, what's you know, what's really key here is if you uh you know, somebody could make the counter argument and say, well, you know, I could totally picture how a really big boulder frozen to the base of the glacier moves over the surface and kind of gouges out this channel here. And if you think about that happening, what you'd expect to see is a very rough resulting kind of gouge. Yeah. You would not expect to see something so smooth. And so you, you, with these forms, you have both the, the component of having smoothed the surface yet having had the ability to preserve really, really delicate features that, that, that are part of that smooth, delicate form, right? The, the, the full feature. So um, ice is really, it's difficult to do it with ice that way. You kind of have to pick and choose. If you want a boulder to gouge out the form, it's not going to be smooth. If you want the surface to be smooth because you abrade it, it's not going to preserve delicate features, mm -hmm. right? right? And so with water erosion, you, you're, you have a mechanism that can both produce a smooth uh, surface, and it's smooth in part because that water that's turbulent is carrying some sedimentary particles that do some amount of abrasion. But the 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 how do they say the pattern where the abrasion happened is dictated by a larger turbulent structure in the fluid itself. Okay, right. I think does that make sense? Yes. Now, where is this relative to the southern margin of the the whatever lobe this well, was we're, in Ohio? We're, we're in Lake Erie. Okay. Near the oh. southern shore of Lake Erie, you know, and so it's like northern Ohio, right? Uh -huh. So we're not that far from the margin, but we're not right at the margin. Gotcha. Which is pretty typical for drumlin swarms. Yeah, they occur all over. I mean, it's not, you know, there's, right. they're, they're not specifically indicative of margins necessarily. Necessarily. But we don't find them beyond the margins. That, I think, is a key That's, that's key, exactly. So we've kind of been dancing around this picture 
without showing it, but there it is, right? This There's a schematic of what we're talking about in terms of being able to have a, a flow of this turbulent fluid, in this case, be water, and it produces this turbulent structure, this horseshoe vortex, as it's known. So uh, you have these counter-rotating vortices that you can see them on either side that split off from the flow that has to flow around an obstacle, just like we saw in the plaster of Paris. And this is what's doing the work, right? This is actually what's excavating. And so that vortex is carrying some sediment. It's abrading, so it produces a, a relatively smooth surface along the, the stoss side and then along the flanks. But it's also producing these really, really sharp rims uh, in the bedrock. So you kind of get the, the combo of those two, those two parts. And importantly, it leaves behind a residual, right? It leaves behind something that ends up being the rat tail or might be uh, the drumlin if it's large enough, as we'll chat about in a few minutes. Um, but the residual is the form that you see, but it's integrally deformed by, uh, deformed, defined by the fact that the form itself is really dictated by these areas where you stripped away material. And this is like, this is not a complicated diagram, and it's not an esoteric concept that flow, like turbulent fluid splits around an obstacle. Engineers know this problem forever with bridge piers, and there's, you know, excavation around the foot of bridge piers, especially when the flow, you know, during floods. It's a real engineering issue because you get exactly the same structure developing in one of these bridge abutments or these, these piers on the bridge, and it strips away all the material that you've anchored your bridge into. So it's a real issue, but it's, this is not you know, something that is uh, particularly controversial in and of itself because the form itself and the, the, the turbulent structure, it's all over the hydraulic engineering literature. Nobody would bat an eye at this diagram. Uh, and there is a, a computer simulation of it. If you know, some people only believe it if a computer spits oh, it yeah. out. So there it is. Um, I'm just <laughs> being a little flippant, but <laughs> but you you get the this is kind of an interesting visual because you really see the the different patterns of turbulence that are produced. This is in the the engineering example. Imagine this is your bridge pier, and you can predict where you're going to have preferential excavation and erosion, where you're going to have your problems where materials being stripped away. Where this becomes a bit more controversial is the argument that this happens in enormous flows of water underneath a continental ice sheet. Okay, that's where the we'll see the sticking point tends to be. But in and of itself, this kind of we call this a form process relationship. There's a form and there's a process to explain it. It's a, it's very strong, right? There's that linkage between what you see as a as a form or the product and then what creates it. It's a pretty solid. Uh, argument in terms of why you might produce a residual and preferential excavation. Why don't we stop there? All right. For now, before we move to drumlins. Yeah, fantastic. Can do. Fascinating right. stuff, man. Thank you so much. Yeah.